Peter wants to grab on to what he knows how to do better than anything. He knows how to fish. He did it for a living, hadn't done it for a while, and he says, you know what? I'm going to go back to the way things used to be. I'm going fishing. And all the rest of the apostles, James and John, are thinking, yeah, we're going to catch the bigger ones. And uh, they're all going to. And then uh, other ones that weren't normally fishing said, we're coming. So seven of them went out. Where the other ones were, who knows. But the reality was seven of them decided, we're going to go fishing. We're going to do something that is, and it's going to be pure fun, except for it wasn't fun. They didn't catch anything. They fished and fished and fished. And over and over again, I'm, I'm sure Peter's thinking, I thought I knew how to do this. I really thought I knew how to do this. James and John are thinking, there's got to be a fish here somewhere. And they're going, that is the most frustrating thing when you get all excited about you're going to go do something like that. And then it collapses. It's not a pretty night. It's a very unhappy day. So um, after catching nothing, they, at the dawn, Jesus is standing on the shore. And I don't know why they translated children. It probably should be little ones. But even still, uh, Jesus often called his apostles the little ones. But um, little ones, he, he yells out. What an interesting thing. They should have recognized him just by them, him calling that. But he said, little ones, have you caught anything to eat? Like he's really hungry sitting on the shore. And uh, they said no. He said, well, cast the net over to the right side of the boat. And Peter's thinking, who is this clown telling me how to fish? You know, I did this for a living. This is what I do. I know this is something I, I can hold on to. You know, and he says, cast the net over to the side. So, okay, we'll entertain. They cast it, and instantly, 153 fish. They tell you the number of fish. St. Jerome said they mentioned 153 fish because there were 153 varieties of fish known at that time. So St. Jerome was writing pretty close to the time, so he might be pretty accurate there. But there were 153 different varieties, so that and John is trying to bring across the message that everyone has a place in Jesus' kingdom. Everyone belongs. All different kinds all belong. And, but whatever it was, they caught 153 of them, and they weren't able to pull it in. But the best part, now they changed these words to lightly clad to guard your ears, but Peter was naked. <laughs> if you read it in the Latin, he's naked. If you read it in the Greek, he's naked. Um, so Peter was naked, and that's very important in that section, because if you remember, when God made Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had sinned, God had walked with them in the garden, and he came walking in the garden, and he said, Adam, Eve, Adam, Eve, and they're not saying anything. He said, Adam, where are you? Adam says, we're hiding. <laughs> Why are you hiding? We're naked. <laughs> Who told you you were naked? <laughs> Why does this make any difference to you? You were just as naked before. Why does this make any difference to you now? But all of a sudden, symbolically, it's saying we can't come before God as we are because there's something that makes us feel guilty, something that makes us not fit. And of course, Peter, who denied Jesus three times and wept for the entire week over the fact that he had denied Jesus, there's something between him. You don't throw on clothes to jump in the water. That's not the normal thing you do. But he's naked. He throws on the clothes and jumps in the water. He, he can't stand before Jesus as he is. So very much like the first man in Adam, now we see Peter coming before Jesus. And no wonder if at the end we'll hear him ask, do you love me? But we'll get to that. Anyhow, so the, the apostles all come in, and they, um, as they come on shore, he's ready to feed them. So what is Jesus doing? He's preparing them breakfast. And how you think, it makes you think of Isaiah when it says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare a feast of rich, juicy foods and pure, choice wines. And it repeats it, rich, juicy meats and pure, choice wines. This vision of God cooking for us and this vision of Jesus cooking for his disciples. Imagine the God who they had failed so miserably, their brother, their God, their everything, and now 
He's cooking for them. He doesn't care what happened before. Today's a new day, and I'm feeding you. And um, so this this beautiful section, and um, so that he's cooking the, the fresh fish that they had just caught. Say, come have breakfast, and. It says the disciples did not dare to ask him who they were, who he was. So somehow he was different. He looked different. They knew it was him unquestionably. <clears throat> they absolutely realized it was him. But somehow there was something different about him. But not only about him, about them, about their whole life. Life has changed as life often does. And afterwards, that's when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord. Do you love me more than all the rest of these? Yes, Lord, I love you. He had said that before the, the, the crucifixion. He said, Lord, you know I love you more than anybody. I'll never deny you. And so he said, uh, okay, well, if you love me, what I want you to do is forget about, don't think about loving me. Feed my lambs. Feed the others. And he says the second time, son of John, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. He's getting a little upset now. And Jesus said, well, um, tend my sheep. And a third time, um, now this place he's saying, tend. Um, take care of them. Guard them. Make sure they have what they need. Tend my sheep. And Jesus said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was so distressed. <coughs> Just like he got distressed the third time, people said to him, um, yeah, surely you were with him. He said, I don't even know this man. And he started to curse and swear. Now he's getting distressed again like he did at the denial. And he said, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Not only tend them, feed them. Supply their nourishment. Be there to, for whatever they need. And um, then, then he again goes back to this. Uh, he said, um, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. So again, he's using this clothing imagery. You have a control. Your clothes are telling a story. You could do what you want. You could say who you were by the way you dressed. But he said, later on, others will define you. Others will say who you are and how you are, and you'll be quite out of control. What, again, a message. Quite out, totally out of control as he was eventually crucified upside down on a cross. But this whole reading speaks about something that is so common in our life. It's transitions. Transitions are always very, very difficult for us. And whatever the transition is, there's always this time of adjustment, always this time of trying to figure out who we are, how we are, how this story is going to work. And whether it's just in times of growing, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing how we, we um, get used to using our body and we can do things and we get more and more control. Whether it's in times where um, suddenly, the, the first stage where your child says, pick me up, and you say, no, you're too big now. I'm not going to pick you up, you have to walk. And I can remember one young man that I raised um, when he was seven, he was very little, so I would pick him up and throw him around and stuff. And he said, pick me up. And I said, no, I'm not going to pick you up. And he said, why aren't you going to pick me up? And I said, because you're 32 and you weigh 180 pounds. <laughs> no. And you can't sit on my lap either. <laughs> the reality is, you get to these stages where there's a transition, and you don't know what to do with it. There's a period of time, like the apostles had, where it's so hard. What do we do now? What do we do during this time? And there's a time, and you know, for many of you, most of you, we know the empty nest sy syndrome, as I kept getting another kid, and then all of a sudden one day I didn't get another kid, and I thought, what am I going to do now? It's like all of a sudden you realize that they're not coming home anymore, that they're spending more time with their girlfriend, or there's athletic activities, and all of a sudden what dominated your life for so long is totally out of your life. And then you go through this stage of wondering, what am I supposed to do now? And sometimes husbands and wives meet each other on a whole different level. 
What do we do now that we're old? <laughs> you know, the reality is there's this whole transition stage. There's transition stages that come from illness. Suddenly we fi find we can't do what we used to do. All of a sudden, some doctor will tell us, you have to take this pill for the rest of your life. And we go, <gasps> for the rest of my life? What do you mean I have to take this pill for the rest of my life? Well, I think you're going to brush your teeth for the rest of your life. I think you're going to comb your hair for the rest of your life. So why does it matter if you have to take this pill for the rest of your life? What is going on in your head? You know, the reality of transitions, we don't like them. We don't like also to know that things are not going to be how they used to be. Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday, and it was never like he used to be. There was a death there that he suffered, that they suffered, and it would never, ever again go back to the way it was. They weren't going to go home and watch Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> they were going to go back to a whole different life. Life changed, and our life changes over and over again. And when it changes, it's so powerful and so important that we don't keep trying to find what was. I remember when I used to buy birdseed, and I would buy 100-pound bags. And then, later on, I didn't buy 100-pound bags anymore because I couldn't get them out of the trunk of my car. <laughs> they were, at one time, very easy to get out of the trunk of my car, but they got heavier. 100 pounds got heavier as I got older. And then, I, so I bought 50-pound bags. Now I'm ready to move to 25. <laughs> and maybe that's a little bit much. But the reality is, Things don't work like they used to. I remember when I get up and think about what I was going to do. Now I ask. Now I wake up and I ask myself, "What's working today?" <laughs> Let's see what's working and see if there's something that can entertain me from it. You know, the reality is our life changes, and we're faced each day with making ourselves miserable because we can't do like we used to do, because we're 80 years old and we can't throw the kinds of baskets that we wanted to, and we aren't good at football anymore. We can't hold ourselves back to those stages that used to be, but we treasure them. We keep them in our memories, like the Gospels, keep in our memories. We keep everything. We save it and savor it. It's all good, it's all beautiful, and it's Gone. <laughs> you know, and it's the same thing when we lose people in our life. It's the same thing when we get divorced or become widowed or a widower. We, all of these different things, there's these transitions, and we're called to go through a breathing stage like the apostles were going through here. But hopefully, the end of it is that we will embrace the new. And if we look back over our whole life, there were some parts that were really good, and there are some parts that were really awful, and that's okay. All of them taught us something. All of us brought, uh, brought the, all of those stages brought us to this moment, to where we are now, and we're on a transition, and it's not going to end here. It's going to end there. It's going to end in a whole different world. So as we go through these transitions in our life, and there's so many of them, I mean, taking care of children, taking care of parents, taking care of a sister or brother, taking care of so many people, and then all of a sudden not taking care of them anymore. It's a transition. It's a change. Um, what you're, what you're able, what able, being able to walk with a rapid pace can give way very quickly to who knows how fast we're going to move from here to the end of the church. I mean, it's a long way. But all of a sudden, things change. But each day, we're challenged to embrace this new life. Each day, we're challenged to recognize that Jesus is on the shore, challenging us, come, bring what you have yourself. Yourself as you are. Yourself, you don't need to change anything. You don't need to cover anything. You don't need to pretend anything. Bring yourself as you are, and let me guide and direct your life. Let me take care of you. Open your hearts to me. And so as we, we have this challenge in this Easter season, I think so many of us are in those different stages of life where we don't know where we're going, we don't know what's next, we don't know what's happening tomorrow. It doesn't matter. He knows. All we need is the gift of ourselves shared today, given to others, as he says, when you don't know what to do for yourself, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed those sheep. 
and you'll find somehow I'm right there in your midst. After Mass, we ask you to join us for a little bit in the uh, hall for um, refreshments and just to take a moment to, to uh, um, talk with Art and also to meet Chris, who is our new um, music director, and hopefully um, we'll continue to bring on this the same kind of wonderful things, and you're welcome to do any fundraising you'd like. <laughs> we'd like the 650000 uh, Let us pray. It also means that if you want to come to our night at the races at um, St. Mary's next week, um, Julie has tickets over here. Um, so um, um, we have tickets for the dinner. It's going to be a great fun time. A little bit of kindness on your people, O oh Lord, and grant that those you were pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Praises, all our hearts are filled with love.